Well, good morning. morning. First, I want I want to thank uh, Tom and and Ron for their thoughts already this morning because when Tom said we need to get out of the physical and focus on the spiritual, that that's encouraging so much to to be able to change our focus from the things around us to the one above us, and I just I, I, that, that encouraged me so much. And then when Ron, you. We were talking this morning about the difficulties that Jesus and the apostles faced as they went through that ministry. And can you imagine three years of what Jesus and the apostles went through with everybody just pounding them with different ideas and different thoughts and opinions and why do you believe this and what, how do you, what gives you the authority for that and all those things day after day after day. It must have been exhausting. And so, you know, if, if they could go through it for three years, surely we can endure it for a few months, hopefully a few months. That's what we're shooting for anyway. So thank you both for your encouragement this morning before we even got into, into too much else. I'll I tell you, I, I don't know if y'all have had this experience or not. But when people find out that I'm a preacher, they ask one question to begin with, where? And then you can't imagine what the second question would be. Well, you may guess it in time, but I was at a, I was at a tire store getting my tire patched one day. And this guy was patching my tire for me and we were just chit-chatting while he was working. And he said, so what kind of work you do? This was in Kentucky. What kind of work you do? I said, I'm a preacher. He said, you're a preacher? Well, I got a question for you. That seven-headed beast in Revelation, what does that mean? I said, well, let's back up just a little bit. How, well, I said, what is your background in the... He said, oh, I ain't never been to church before, but I've been hearing about that dragon. What is that? And I thought, maybe we could start with something simpler first before we get to that, you know. And just a few weeks ago, well, a few days ago, actually, uh, I was in a conversation with a lady, and, and she said, so what do you do? And I said, I'm a preacher. Really? What, where? Came up back to Church of Christ. Well, I got a question for you. Well, I knew what was coming. It was from Revelation. And it was a question about the, the end times and Armageddon and a thousand years. You know, just... It, and, I, and her background in Scripture is, from what our discussion I learned, is not that deep. So why is it that people want to dive into the deep end of Revelation without wading in first? And so that, I've been thinking about that over the course of the past few weeks. And, and I actually got a, an article this week from a friend of mine uh, who was a, a preacher. He's actually, a, uh, he teaches at a preaching school back in Tennessee. And he shared this article. And I want to read it to you this morning because it is so appropriate to, uh, to what we just, we just talked about. Listen to, listen to this. The title of the article is Things in the Bible That Worry Me Most. Okay? I can assure you right now, the seven-headed beast in Revelation does not worry me. You know, because Revelation, to me, Revelation is a shout of victory. Revelation says, hey, we win. So I don't worry about every little detail of what Revelation means other than, hey, folks, we're the winners. That's what I take. That's my, that's my entire explanation of Revelation. We're the winners. So... This is his, his article on things in the Bible that worry me most. Have you ever entertained the thought that there may be something in the Bible that you are failing to understand properly that could have eternal ramifications for you? Admittedly, there are some rather complex and difficult passages in the Bible. Even the Apostle Peter said so himself in 2 Peter 3, 16. 
If you remember what he says there, he says, if you read Paul's letters, some things in there are difficult to understand. And some of the unlearned and untaught people have taken those and twisted them into what they never meant. So he said, there are some things that are difficult to understand. So here's my question. What are the top five most worrisome verses in the Bible to you? And while you're thinking about that, allow me to share mine. This is still part of the article now. I'm not editorializing at all. I'll get to that in a minute. Number one, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Matthew 22, 37. Love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 39. Pursue holiness. Hebrews 12, 14. Abhor what is evil, Romans 12, 9. Preach the gospel to everyone, Mark 16, 15. Now, if you'll notice, my top five worrisome passages are not passages that are difficult to understand. They don't have anything to do with the mark of the beast, the identity of the man of lawlessness, or how the Holy Spirit indwells a Christian, or the present or future state of the dead. No, my top worrisome passages are easy to understand. That's what makes them so worrisome to me. I can't say, but Lord, I didn't understand what that passage meant. Had I properly understood it, I would certainly have been obedient. My list of worrisome passages is worrisome to me, not because of their difficulty to understand, but because of their clarity. The difficulty is not in understanding them, but in obeying them. Maybe it would serve us well if we would spend less time on some questions and more time on others. What do you think? And so I read that article about 10 times over and over and that, that line when he says the difficulty is not in understanding them but in obeying them. Now does anybody else, does that strike anybody else? That just jumped out at me like, you know, that it's not hard to figure out what we're supposed to do. Doing what we're supposed to do, that's where the rub comes in. That's where, that's where it becomes more difficult. So I sat down and I made a list of my five most worrisome passages. And I want, to want, want to ask you to do this. I want to ask you sometime over the next couple of days is sit down and think about passages that are, are worrisome to you for these same reasons. <clears throat> Not because they're difficult to figure out, but they're difficult to carry out. And so as I was reading and thinking about this, I came up with my top five plus several, several honorable mentions. My number one is Matthew 6, 15. If you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. I mean, is there anything that's mysterious about that? I mean, that's pretty clear. When, I mean, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. Forgiven. So we can't stand before God one day and say, well, God, I, I, I plead for your forgiveness. I, I long for your forgiveness. And have him say, well, then why didn't you offer forgiveness? How can you expect to receive it from me if you wouldn't offer it to someone else? Remember the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18? The servant owes his master so much money. He could never repay it. And he goes in and he pleads with the master and says, please forgive me of this debt. And the master in his compassion forgives the debt. The servant immediately goes out, finds a friend of his, owes him just a little bit, takes him by the throat, threatens him, says, pay me what you owe me or else. And then he goes and has him thrown into prison. And when verse 34, it says, when the master found out, he was angry. I don't want to stand before God and have him angry at me for not forgiving like I should. That passage is worrisome to me 
forgive or you won't be forgiven because I, I will, I'm in the spirit of transparency, y'all. There have been times in my life that I have held on. I have held on to whatever it was and I was not about to forgive. It's hard sometimes. The passage is clear. My number two, still in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. You know, it's, it, it's worrisome to me to think there are people who are going through life fully and entirely convinced that they are just right with God. Because if you remember what the verse that follows that, but then they'll say, Lord, didn't we do great things in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? We did wonders and signs and miracles in your name. And Jesus says, I don't know you. It worries me, it bothers me that there will be people who stand before God fully convinced of their relationship with God and their unquestionable salvation. And Jesus looks and says, I don't know you. Does anybody else think about, anybody else worry about that? Think about that. There's so many people. And y'all there, and, and I'm going to tell you, I, I don't want to be one of those people with that I, and I walk up to the throne with confidence because I know that I've done everything I should do and I've accomplished what I should have accomplished and I've done all these things. And then Jesus says, no. You did a lot of stuff. I don't. What a tragedy. What a horrible moment to stand before God, stand before Jesus and say, and here, I don't know you. That passage is worrisome to me. Number three for me, Ephesians 4, 29. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth except for what is good for edification, that it may bring, bring grace to the hearers. Now, I don't have an, a, a potty, what I call a potty mouth. I don't have a potty mouth. I don't say ugly words. I don't cuss and swear and pitch a big fit. But what do, are my words, are my words beneficial? Are my words good for edification? Do I build up with my words or do I tear down with my words? Sometimes I'll think about this verse and I realize, you know what? I have just violated that corrupt communication part because what I just said wasn't good for edification. It wasn't good for encouragement. It didn't impart grace to the hearers. And so I think about this and I think, wow, how can I be so foolish? It doesn't mean that you can't say words that are on that list of words that we can't say. It means if it's not beneficial, if it's not encouraging, if it's not imparting grace to the hearers, it is corrupt communication that's tearing people down. And when I think about that verse, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm guilty of that too. Yeah, I'm, and that's why these things worry me because I can look at them and think, wow, if I'm really honest, if each one of us is really honest, we can probably find a time <clears throat> that we are guilty of some of these things. And so when I think about this passage of, in Ephesians 4, it, it follows it up with, with no malice and, and, and show brotherly love and show kindness. And, and it says, don't do these things. 
Don't, don't tear people down, but build each other up and encourage and strengthen each other and show brotherly love to each other. So we've got the things we, we don't do, but then things that we're supposed to do. Which is pretty common all throughout Scripture. Number four for me. Philippians 4, verse 6. And I'm going to tell you, for a lot of us these days, this one is going to hit home. Be anxious for nothing. But with prayer and supplication, with all thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. If anybody here has not been anxious at all in the last four or five months, then I want to talk to you in the foyer when we get done and get some advice and encouragement. Because most of us have been anxious somehow or another. We have let anxiety and fear and all those things creep in. And I'm going to tell you, there are some days it is just like being bombarded day after day, moment after moment with one thing after another that creates fear and anxiety and stress. And I'm going to tell you, that doesn't mean that, that you can't be concerned about things. We have people here whose family members have been sick. We have people here who've lost family members. We have people here who own businesses that are struggling. We have people here whose jobs are threatened. We have all those things going on. And so for me to stand here and say, well, don't worry about anything, that sounds pretty cavalier, doesn't it? I'm just going to, that sounds real cavalier for me to say, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. And I'm going to promise you folks, everything is going to be fine. Maybe not the way we would describe fine. Maybe not the way we imagine fine. But in God's terms, everything is going to be fine. Because again, I've read to the end of the book and I know how it ends. And it's a great ending. And so for us to think about this moment where, where Paul is writing to the church in Philippi and he says, don't be anxious with prayer and thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. Just talk to Him. God wants to hear from you all the time. I, I, I can picture God, if I had to call Him on the phone, I can just picture Him sitting, waiting by the phone, just waiting for it to ring, hoping that His children are calling Him. He wants to hear from us. Number, number five for me is James 2.10. Whoever keeps the whole law yet stumbles in one point is guilty of all of it. Does that bother anybody else or just me? <laughs> that, one, that one just tears me up. Because you know what? I'm not a bad guy. <laughs> we aren't bad people. But to hear that if we violate one part of the law, we have violated the whole thing. Does that mean then that, that these, other these other people out here doing those vile, heinous things and being mean, is that, does that put me in the same category as them? <laughs> well, what James writes like a punch to the gut, is if you keep the whole law, yet break part of it, you've broken the whole law. And that's just, that's just what it says. That bothers me because I like to think of myself as a pretty good guy. And then to think, well, wow, I'm, I'm as bad as the extortioners, the revilers, the, the backbiters, the God-haters, the murderers, the malicious, the, all of, I'm, I, I'm as bad as those people. I've obviously broken the whole law. Those things worry me. Those are my top five. So I want I want to tell you, go ahead and, and over the next few days, make your top five. And if you want to share them, that's great. If not, if you want to just think about them and pray about them, that's fine too. But I've got a couple of honorable mentions I want to, I want to give you before we get away. Matthew 10, verses 37 and 38. 
He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son and daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. You know, that just, that one hurts because I'm, I love my kids. I love my wife. I love my family. And I just don't, I don't know. I mean, do, do we really think about that? Do we, could we really make that conscious decision between our children or our spouse or our parents and say, I want to follow God no matter what? Could we, could we do that? Because y'all, that's hard. When if it really comes down to that, that one is hard. Matthew 25, verse 41 Depart from me, you cursed, into the lake of fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Okay, that, that verse bothers me. But the circumstances around that verse are really bothersome. Because look at what... How many of y'all grew up in this household? The household of, here are the things you can't do. Anybody grew up in that household? Here's the list of stuff that you can't do. That's, that's, the, that's the church environment I grew up in. <clears throat> I didn't grow up in the church environment of here's the things you better do. Here's some things that we, if we are truly Christians, here's some things we have to do. See, because if you look at this passage in Matthew 25, those who are rewarded are rewarded for the good things they did. Those who are condemned are not condemned for all the bad stuff they did, but for all the good stuff they didn't do. That's, that is hard. It's not like you are such a bad person. You did all these vile things. You're cast in the lake of fire prepared for the devil and his angels. No, Jesus says, you simply didn't do the good stuff. All the simple things that you were supposed to do, the good things you were supposed to do, you didn't do them. So that whole, that whole scene is bothersome to me because, you know, I like to think, hey, I don't do all those bad things. But then, do I do all the good things? John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this and to lay down his life for his friends. Jesus has just finished say, saying this commandment that I'm giving you is that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus is about to give his life on the cross for his disciples and for the entire world. Even the people who weren't going to care. He was about to be stretched out on the cross and killed for everyone. And he says, greater love has no man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And he just said, and what I'm doing, you need to do. And again, I don't know that I'm ready to take that step to give my life for you. I'm just going to be honest. I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I can. I don't know that I would. I don't, I don't know. And so this verse is worrisome to me because Jesus says, this is how you're supposed to love. Howard, this is how I'm supposed to love you. I'm supposed to give my life for you. Sue, I'm supposed to die for you if I need to. Dale, I'm supposed to die for you if I need to. Every person, we're supposed to die for that person if we need to. That's what Jesus tells us. I don't know. I don't know. We have Romans 1, 28 through 32, that list of bad people. You know, it goes from the really bad stuff, you know, murder and malicious and, and, and all this stuff, all the way down to whisperers and disobedient to parents. I mean, it starts bad, and you think, I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those people. I'm not, ooh, 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 hold on, I might, I might be one of those people. And the passages are endless. You know, Galatians 5, we have the works of the flesh we're not supposed to be a part of. 
You know, in, in um, Philippians 2, I think verses 3 and 4, you know, don't do anything out of selfish ambition, but put the, the welfare of others above your own. You know, all these passages of things that it, it's, it's, they're not mysterious. We don't have to break them down and dissect them and, and we can just read them and understand exactly what they mean and then say, is that me? Am I that person? That's part of what is worrisome about some of these passages. Simply, am I that person? Am I the one who's doing this? Or not doing this? Am I abiding by this? Am I ignoring this? Is this something I've never even read before, never even thought about before because it is so simple? The truth is, friends, it is simple. It's not mysterious. Not hard to figure out. And so that's why it's so important for us to understand that God has made the way for us so clear. He has cleared out all the obstacles and, and the blood of Jesus Christ has built this bridge across this great chasm that we created with our own sin. But, but the blood of Jesus has given us access to this wonderful eternal place called heaven. And folks, I want to go. I just, I, I want to go. So let's not worry about the, the seven-headed beast. You know, who knows? Let's not worry about all that. Let's just make sure that we love each other like we're supposed to. That we forgive each other like we're supposed to. That we do good to one another like we're supposed to. No. Let's make sure we get the easy stuff right. So for the next couple of days, be thinking about your passages, your scriptures, the ones that, that speak to you. And I would love for you to share them with me if you want to. If you want to send me an email or a text, I would love for you to share with me because I, I mean I can I can learn so much from what you tell me about what your passages are and share them. And if you need to call somebody, just say, you know what, I've been reading this passage and it bothers me. Can we, can we pray together about this? Because I struggle with, with this. Can we do that? You, think, you think, think we could actually talk to each other and share with each other and pray with each other about struggles, about fears? Think we can do that? I, I, you know what, I bet we can. I bet we can do that. I'm going to pray for us right now, so let's bow together. Father, it is absolutely amazing to us the way you love us. It's incredible how simple your instructions are to us. And amazing, Father, how difficult we make it sometimes. When I asked you this morning to help us to see the simplicity of your will and to understand the glorious resurrection that's waiting for us if we'll just do what you ask us. Father, we are thankful for grace. We are thankful for mercy. We are thankful for your forgiveness and your patience. And Father, we pray that we can bask in all those things, but not only enjoy them, Father, but also share them and give them. So, Father, we just ask that you continue to be patient with us. We know you're still working on us. And we just pray that we can be like the clay and just completely submit ourselves to be informed in your hands. Father, we love you. And we pray that everything we do and everything that we say, everything we're involved in shows you how much we love you. 
and how grateful we are for salvation through Jesus. In whose name we pray, amen.